segregation. In the American South, the word meant more than just to separate. Segregation was a way of forcing African Americans into a life reminiscent of slavery, a bondage only recently removed by the Civil War. Segregation signified a code of behavior, with expected subservience by blacks and whites certain of their own superiority. When political and social decisions were made, color was always a factor. In the early 20th century, justice or respect was a far cry from what African American citizens received as the result of segregation. The attitude existed everywhere, in the Cotton Belt as well as the mountains of western North Carolina, where slavery was never prevalent. Segregation made answers easy for whites when questions arose about Negro behavior. Accusations always took a darker turn to find a scapegoat. November 10, 1898, Wilmington, North Carolina. At the time, the largest city in the state, Wilmington was a place of opportunity for African Americans who prospered in business and politics there. For these individuals, the Republican Party offered a place within a biracial coalition. However, Wilmington was often used as an example of Negro domination by Democrats in the South. 1898 municipal elections exploded tensions between the two. As a result of the vote, Republicans maintained control over Wilmington city government. The white supremacists and former Confederates would not accept this outcome. Two days after the election, a mob gathered and attacked the Wilmington Daily Record, the state's only black-owned newspaper, forcing its editor, Alexander Manley, to flee for his life. He never returned to Wilmington. The mob, led by Alfred Waddell, took to the streets. After destroying the newspaper press and the building, Waddell's men spent the day terrorizing the people of Wilmington, forcing many African Americans to leave town immediately without an opportunity to gather belongings before they left. They were the lucky ones. Others were just murdered. The estimated number of deaths ranged from six to 100. By incomplete records from hospitals, churches, and the coroner's office, the exact number of people killed remains unknown. During this catastrophe, only blacks were targeted. Waddell forced the white Republican mayor and other members of the city council to resign from their positions. A new city council was selected, and Waddell took over as mayor by the end of the day. This event was the first and only instance of an open overthrow of city government by force in the United States. Neither Waddell nor any of the mob were ever charged with the multitude of murders or the coup d'etat of Wilmington city government. Many of the once prosperous African American community in Wilmington lost everything they had that day, including their lives. January 18, 1921, a 16-year-old African-American named Plummer Bullock bought apples at a store in Norlina, North Carolina. Noticing he'd paid for premium-grade apples but got rotting ones, he wanted a refund. The store clerk refused, saying, Not after they have been in your black hands will I take them back. Brother of the clerk, Ravy Trailer, who was white, suggested lynching. Bullock left the store. The incident was thought forgotten. A few days later, Plummer Bullock returned to town with his brother, 21-year-old Matthew, a World War I veteran, and his cousin, Jerome Hunter. They again encountered Ravy Trailer. Angry words led to gunshots, and several were wounded. Local officials declared the event a riot and charged all the African Americans and Ravy Trailer. Charges against Trailer were later dropped. A mob gathered at the Warren County Jail, where Plummer Bullock and Jerome Hunter were being held. The vigilantes took the two men from the jail, who were later found on the side of the road dead from bullet wounds. Fears of protest by the black community convinced lawyer Tasker Polk, the nephew of the 11th president, to gather a group of whites to disarm African Americans in Warrington. He argued that individuals like Matthew Bullock, brother and cousin of the victims, had returned from World War I corrupted by Northern influence and European decadence, forgetting his place in Southern society. Even with roadblocks, Matthew Bullock managed to escape the mob, fleeing to Canada, ending another acute confrontation between black and white in North Carolina, this one over an apple. June 21, 1927, 5.30 p.m. 15-year-old Gladys Kincaid ended her shift at Guru Knitting Mill in downtown Morganton, North Carolina. She began her mile and a half trek home, but she never arrived. After being found later that night with mortal wounds to the side of her head, seemingly caused by a lead pipe found not too far from the crime scene, police decided upon a suspect. Their selection was African-American construction worker Broadus Miller. When sheriff's deputies went to Miller's residence to investigate, he was absent. What was found was a bloodstained raincoat said to have belonged to Gladys Kincaid. A massive mob-style manhunt ensued. 
armed men roamed the streets of Morganton and all surrounding countrysides. After 13 days of searching in what was later called the largest manhunt in Western North Carolina's history, Broadus Miller was spotted in Linville Falls, North Carolina. Morganton resident Commodore Burleson tracked down Miller, found him deep in the woods near Linville Gorge, and shot Miller to death. Broadus Miller was transferred back to Morganton, where a frenzy developed. Tied to the back of Burleson's car, Miller's body was dragged through the streets until it arrived at the Burke County Courthouse. One journalist reported over 5,000 people waited to see the corpse of the accused murderer. Miller was later laid to rest in an unmarked field in Statesville, North Carolina. And the story of Broadus Miller and Gladys Kincaid goes down as one of the most brutal acts of vigilante justice in North Carolina's history. Was Broadus Miller guilty of murder? Since he was denied his right to defend himself in court, we'll never know. Thought to be moderate on issues of race compared to states in the Lower South, North Carolina was still a dangerous place for African Americans in the Jim Crow era. 168 died at the hands of mobs in the state between 1865 and 1941. The threat forced many more to live in fear of similar reprisals by the white community. It wasn't until the Civil Rights era that the cloud began to lift on injustices done to those victimized North Carolinians and a brutally unfair but commonplace practice could be ended.